Allow me now to introduce our two speakers um, to you. Uh, Mark Bevere is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for British Studies here at IES. He's also Professor of Governance at the United Nations University and Professor of Political Economy at King's College London. Matt Beach is founding director of the Center for British Politics and a reader in politics in the Department of Politics at the University of Hull in the United Kingdom. In 2017, Matt was a visiting scholar in our Center for British Studies here at IES and we're very proud to have him uh, in our team of senior fellows at the Institute of European Studies. Gentlemen, Mark and Matt, thank you so much for making time uh, to join us for today's conversation. And before I give the word to Terry, I wanted to start by asking both of you uh, to comment in, in general terms on where we currently are with Brexit. Uh, as a result of, of the coronavirus outbreak, uh, the focus, as you know, also here in the United States, temporarily shifted a bit away uh, from Brexit. However, there is still no agreement uh, between the UK government and the EU Commission on a free trade deal. And as you know, this deadline looms. And in principle, the deadline is set for December 31st. But in practice, we all know that a deal is needed by the end of October at the latest. And then the second complicating factor I would like you to briefly comment upon is the recent, the recent decision by the UK government to push forward a UK internal market bill and to ensure open trade with Northern Ireland, which would legally override parts of the Northern Ireland protocol that was signed with the EU. So if this bill moves forward, and it now seems very likely that it will, and the UK would, at least from the opinion of, of the EU Commission, the UK would be breaking international law. So please let us know how you assess uh, the current situation about Brexit in general, and give us also your thoughts on this internal market bill uh, proposal. And perhaps uh, we can start with Matt first, and then we would go uh, to Matt. Uh, but let's start with, uh, with Matt. Matt, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jeroen. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, great to um, be with uh, Mark and my friends at IES. Lovely to be here as ever for a free exchange of ideas. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I think where we're at is clock is ticking. Um, Michel Barnier said um, yesterday that he hopes that a deal is possible. His tone was a bit more positive than it has been. Um, Lord Frost, <clears throat> um, who is the chief negotiator for UK government is, I think, had a pretty constructive last round of talks. It's moved, I mean, when you think where we were in June, it was really stodgy. And, you know, I think for most people who want a, a free trade agreement, and I must admit, from a normative perspective, without being a disinterested academic, I am one of them. Um, I think we're budging towards it. However, yesterday, uh, the internal market bill uh, passed its next stage, 340 to 256. And I think the bottom line is, is that uh, the prime minister and the conservative government will be willing, will be willing to walk away from um, the situation if, and, and accept no deal, if, um, greater assurances are not provided. I think, I think the real problem for the EU is this. They're pushing the line about breaking international law. Well, international treaties are broken all the time. The EU is a master at breaking international law. The, if you think about 2008 and the Eurozone crisis, it made member states liable for the bailouts to Greece and um, to Ireland. You're not allowed to do that under the Lisbon Treaty. Um, also, if, if you think about Airbus um, last year, um, you know, they got an almighty rap on the knuckles for state aid to Airbus. You're not allowed to do that. And obviously then the Trump administration, in effect, retaliated with tariffs. So I, I don't think we should have very much of, oh, my golly gosh, you know, international law. law. It gives people sort of like a, a view in their mind that international human rights are somehow being breached. The old, I think the most important historical thing to bear in mind, 
I mean, this is a very learned audience as ever it is at the IES. But what you have to understand is that the UK is trying to make sure that an international agreement that comes through doesn't undermine the internal sovereignty of the UK. And I, I, if you want to say, well, what do you mean by that? I'll say, well, the Good Friday Agreement or the Belfast Agreement has as one of its key stipulations that nothing is allowed to change the status of, the, of Northern Ireland in relation to Great Britain, in trade, in rights, in, in, um, in social policy, nothing is allowed to, to, to change the Northern Ireland status without the Northern Irish Assembly having a voice. And clearly what happens if we continue with withdrawal agreement, which absolutely the Johnson government signed and they were being, you are, they were playing fast and loose, I think with this, is if they carry on with it as it is, um, we are going to have a situation where the Northern Ireland, status of Northern Ireland in relation to the rest of the UK, in relation to Great Britain is changed. And that's not allowed under the Belfast Agreement. And it's not, and it's not in British national interest because British national interest is the interest to, to keep the, uh, you know, the sort of consistent integrity of the United Kingdom. And so is it, a, is it a challenge to the law, international law in the sense that yes, it is, absolutely. But is that something new? No, it's not. Does the EU breach similar sorts of international agreements and treaties? Of course they do. And so I just think that we have to understand the context of what's being asked. But I would like to see a free trade agreement. Time is ticking, Jeroen, as you quite rightly say. I think things are looking better than they were a few months ago. So fingers crossed. OK, very good. Thank you, Matt. Let's let's um, move to Mark. Mark, your assessment of the current situation. Um, well, I think the first thing I'll say is that I've been so wrong so often on what I think people will do on Brexit that I'm not sure that predicting things is very helpful. Um, I do agree with Matt that at some point the UK government would be willing to walk away without a deal. Um, and, I do, and I do think that's a real possibility. And I do think there are heavy constraints on what the EU can agree to. Um, so I'm not ruling that out. But I thought, given my slight scepticism about prediction, it might help to fill out some of the background of where we are and why. So, I mean, I guess the first thing to say, fairly obviously, is that the, e the UK is no longer part of the EU, that formally the UK left the EU on January the 31st. It's no longer part of the EU. That won't change. It did so under what's called the withdrawal agreement. The withdrawal agreement, which really set up an 11 month transition period, which runs out therefore at the end of December, um, was not about defining future UK EU relations. Mm -hmm. Instead, it was about defining a smooth transition process, which would be what happened during those 11 months. And as a result, the 11 months from last January until this December were meant to be when a range of issues were sort of sorted out. The withdrawal agreement covered the transition, it covered the UK's financial debt to the EU, and it covered Northern Ireland, which at the time I thought was a massive achievement because I thought Northern Ireland would derail everything, but now it looks like it might anyway. Um, it left open trade, it left open regulation, regulations of industry and business, and it left over security and cooperation in security. Those were the three big areas that still needed agreement. There hasn't been much discussion about security cooperation. There's been a bit in the news recently, but not much. The issue of regulation has proved a major sticking point. I suspect actually much more important than we know. Um, and trade has also proved a major sticking point. And if there is no deal, if there is no agreement on future relations by this December the 31st, what will happen is that the UK will find itself trading with the EU under World Trade Organization rules, mm -hmm. which is definitely suboptimal. And that, that's the kind of pressure for both groups. That's the deadline that happens. The withdrawal agreement means if there's no deal, trade will be conducted under, under WTO rules. No one wants that, but it's not clear there's a position that can be agreed to get it. Um, what else would I add? I do, th we, we haven't talked about this, I won't say much about it, but I do think in principle, 
the effect of the coronavirus should mean that the UK is more desperate for a deal than it otherwise would be. Whether, whether the UK government sees it that way is a different matter, but I think it definitely should. I think that's clear cut. I can explain why later. Um, the big sticking points at the moment seem to be fishing, a massive issue. I mean, crudely put, the UK wants its fishermen to have access to EU markets. The EU is probably OK with that, but in return, it wants its fishermen to have access to the UK, to UK coastal waters. The UK is not OK with that. And it might seem like a minor issue, and economically it probably is quite minor. And I think that talking about sovereignty is a bit of a red herring, but the case of, of fishing was so important in the case made for Brexit by the Conservatives that as a political issue, it has much more salience than it probably should have. Um, uh, another big issue, so that's probably the biggest trade issue is probably the fishing one. Another big issue which would come under regulation is about government support to companies. So whether to what extent the UK and or bits of the UK will or will not abide by EU regulations about how much the government can subsidise and support particular industries is a major sticking issue. I suspect probably the most important. And the third big sticking point is enforcement mechanisms, which again, we haven't heard much of, but it's a big sticking point. And the EU is I think a bit unreasonably, and normally I actually quite side with the EU on these things, although I do think, just to go off on a tangent for one minute, I do think it's important to always bear in mind that the EU is not a necessarily a good thing. I do think Britain should have stayed within the EU, but the EU is profoundly undemocratic. It suffers from enormous economic imbalances. And the fact that I don't approve of Brexit should not be taken as meaning that I think the EU is some sort of magnificent institution. It really isn't. It's a disaster area. It's just I would have preferred that the UK tried to reform it from within rather than from without. Um, anyway, the EU would like the enforcement mechanisms of any future. UK EU relations to rely heavily on the European Court of Justice, the ECJ. And the UK, for I think very good reasons, is uncomfortable with that. So I think there are also debates over not only trade and regulation, but also enforcement mechanisms. And then the final thing, which is what you mentioned with the internal market bill that has blown up recently, is Northern Ireland. And again, I'll just sketch some background there. So as part of the withdrawal agreement, the UK government committed itself to what's called the Northern Ireland Protocol. Under the Northern Ireland Protocol, Northern Ireland will continue to effectively obey EU economic rules and regulations. In order for that to be viable, there has to be some sort of customs border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. The nature of the, that that would happen was written into the withdrawal agreement through the Northern Ireland Protocol. An article, I think it's article four, but don't quote me on that. Article four of the Northern Ireland Protocol explicitly gives precedence to the protocol over UK domestic law. And what, so if any attempt by the UK parliament to, pass a law that would go against the protocol is therefore illegal within UK law and the, the framework that's set up. And what's happened with the internal market bill, which the UK government is currently passing, is that it seeks to overturn aspects of the protocol. So the internal market bill does, as the EU has been saying, it does not only break the treaty, it also breaks international law and arguably UK domestic law because it gets in the way of the, because of Article 4. Um, why are we stuck in this position? Obviously, politics. I mean, there are some genuine issues, but the real issue is that, that I, I was absolutely astonished. I mean, really astonished that the UK agreed to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Mm -hmm. I thought there was no way some, a party whose official title is the Conservative and Unionist Party so it's been based and committed to the union of the UK 
including Northern Ireland as its major platform for a very long time, I thought there was no way they would agree to a border between Northern Ireland and the UK, but they did. And I think the main problem is they've come to regret it. Um, and they've come to see it as profoundly problematic, particularly given the moves to devolution in other bits of the UK, which we should probably talk about as part of the context of it. Good, wonderful, thank you. Um, let me now move to, to my colleague Terry for the following question, Terry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those uh, overviews of what's happening with Brexit. I'm gonna uh, ask, uh, is there a Britain after Brexit? If so, what does it look like? And should there be a Britain after Brexit? And I, I uh, give a hat tip to, uh, uh, to um, Richard Ashcroft for uh, formulating that question, but I think it's a good one and I'd like to hear your answers to it. Yeah. So maybe Matt, you go first again. Thank you, Terry. Is there a Britain after Brexit. So I guess, um, is there a United Kingdom after Brexit? So I'm guessing that yourself and Richard, are, uh, I guess implying that um, the breakup of the United Kingdom is, is much closer uh, because of the in, uh, exogenous and endogenous pressures. Um, I think that's unfortunately, probably accurate that we're nearer to that. I mean, not in terms of Wales. I mean, there's not the appetite for independence in Wales. In Scotland, there is, but I, I don't foresee it happening. I don't foresee it happening for the reasons that I said in my first ever IES lecture back in 2017, um, Brexit and its aftershocks. It's, you have five and a half million people in a first world industrialized country with an advanced welfare state uh, public pensions, public health, public subsidised public transport, free universities, and uh, there's just not simply the tax base um, in Scotland, even if you figure the oil, so the oil, the UK oil is 90% of it is in off Scottish waters, 90% of the gas is off English waters, even if Her Majesty's government, after a positive uh, re um, referendum, let's say, hypothetically, um, went in the way of yes, in other words, the way of independence. I don't foresee Her Majesty's government wholesale giving um, uh, the, a Scottish government access to Scottish oil, the mining and exploration of which has been subsidised by the UK taxpayer since the late 1960s and it came on tap in the late 1970s. So even with that, I don't think Scotland is viable in that sense. And also, what about a currency? You know, for a while, the SNP said they wanted to keep the pound. I don't see many British governments allowing them to keep the pound. So then you have to uh, adopt some kind of currency before you meet the certain bars and the regulations before you enter the EU and the, and the Eurozone. So I would still think that the, Sc the Scots are canny and economically the math does not add up. Um, but we'll see. I mean, it could happen. I, I don't want it to happen, um, but I'm a unionist, but it could happen, but I think it's unlikely. I think there is a Britain after Brexit. And I think what, what the 2019 election is showing is that there's the most important issues are cultural. Economics is still important, but economics is not, is not so directly connected to class as it once was. What do I mean by that? British citizens who have competing financial interests find themselves on similar sides of cultural questions and values questions. And that is remarkable when you think about it. People who don't have much versus people who, and some people who have quite a bit, 25% of the richest people in this country voted Brexit um, and three quarters of the poorest people voted Brexit. So people who've got competing in financial interests who live in different parts of the country are now crossing you know, traditional partisan boundaries to because they have similar outlooks about patriotism, about the union, about sovereignty. So there is a Britain after Brexit, I think it's a bumpy one. And I think that which divides Britons is more than that which unites them, sadly, I would probably say. And I'm being pessimistic there, but yeah. And Mark, to you. Well, I get to begin with what I said last time about predictions. I mean, we live in an era where voters seem more than happy to pursue things that are clearly against their own interests. 
And politicians seem delighted to pander to them when they demand things that are against their own interests. So who knows what might happen? Right? Who knows? But in principle, if people are reasonably sensible, there should clearly be a Britain after Brexit. If Scotland is stupid enough to go for independence, that would be astonishing. It would be astonishing partly because the Scottish economy is not very strong and relies on subsidies from Westminster. It would be astonishing partly because the Scottish economy is much more entwined with the economy of the rest of the UK than it is with the EU. And it would be astonishing, perhaps most importantly, because if you were Scottish and you assumed the EU would let you in, you would be crazy. If Scotland separates from the UK and then applies to enter into the EU, and that's the order in which things would have to happen, the chances are that large parts of the EU will vote not to accept Scotland. It is relatively unlikely, for instance, that the Spanish, with their problems with the Basque territory and Catalonia, would approve of a bit of another European nation but seeking independence and then entering the EU. It's also relatively unlikely that Italy, with its northern successionists, would approve of that. And under EU regulations, there has to be unanimity about a new member joining. So all it takes is one of those nations to think, no, we do not want countries to think we can separate from our current country, our current state, and then rejoin the EU, to stop Scotland joining the EU. And absent a guarantee that Scotland would get into the EU, for Scotland to push for independence from the UK is crazy. Um, so in, in theory, in theory, if people are reasonable, there's no way that the UK should break up into the four nations. So let, let's answer that question like that. Should it? I don't know, probably not. Probably not, but I don't really mind. But then there's another question, which I think is quite important, which was you also asked Terry, which is more about British identity here and what it means. And I think that's quite an interesting question. And I think there's an, another issue around Brexit that can get misunderstood, particularly in the US. Because if you assimilate Brexit as anti-immigration to Trump, Brexit can sound as though it's something that's a bit racist. And that's a real mistake. So there is an anti-immigration aspect to Brexit, but the immigrants that the people who want, who support Brexit, the immigrants that the Brexiteers want to keep out are white East European immigrants. They're not ethnic minorities from other parts of the world. So there's no way that you can see Brexit as straightforwardly racist. You might see it as anti a certain culture, which would be East European authoritarian and Catholic, but it's not a racist movement in the same way that you might, after yesterday's presidential debate, for instance, see parts of, of the Trump movement being. Um, and indeed, I would go further and I will predict absolutely without any qualification whatsoever that in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, a UK out of the EU is more multicultural and less racist than the European Union and probably more multicultural and less racist than it would have been if it had stayed within the European Union. And that's not just a contrast between, say, the UK on the one hand, and the obviously authoritarian and racist regimes that exist in places like Hungary. It's also a contrast between a largely multicultural and open British democracy and the heavily racist slash ethnic defined citizenship regimes that you find in places like Italy and Germany. So actually, I think if you're talking about British identity, leaving Europe, the EU, or means that Britain is likely to become more diverse and more pluralistic, certainly than the rest of the EU, and probably than it would have been if it stayed in. So I think British identity will, will continue to become increasingly multicultural and increasingly multiracial. And I don't think leaving the EU has any impact on that. I think it probably won't break up into different nation states, but I don't know. Interesting, yeah. Uh, very interesting views both of you have uh, about the future. And, and at this point, I, I would like to suggest that we go a little bit back in time uh, as well. And, and before I ask my question, just um, 
A reminder to the audience, if you have a question yourself for our speakers, please write down your question in the chat function and in the second part of the conversation, we'll be happy to pass on uh, some of those questions uh, to the speakers. But let's, let's at this point go back a little bit in time. Uh, let's go back to, to the general elections uh, in, in December of 2019. Because See, I would love to hear from you also some clarification on, on the results of, of those elections. Because based on what we saw in the media, right, we got the impression that there was kind of growing opposition against Brexit in, in British society. We would see you know, demonstrations, thousands of people in the streets of London. Uh, you would hear stories about how many people had you know, regretted that they had voted for Brexit because they had been misled. You would hear stories about all, the, all these young people who, who did not vote, but now finally they would have a chance to do so. So all of this, I assume, you know, was supposed to lead to a major victory of the opposition against the man who had played a key role in the Brexit referendum, Boris Johnson. But then we saw the results, right? And, and we saw a defeat of, of the Liberal Democrats who had been the strongest opponents of Brexit. We also saw a defeat of Labour and, and we saw a massive victory of the Conservative Party gaining an 80 seat majority in Parliament. So how do you how do you both explain these these results? And maybe we start again with, with Matt. Great question. Um, hopefully my microphone is less scratchy now. I'm yes. sorry if it was scratching and I was gesticulating and getting animated. Yeah. I think in a way you could answer the question by looking at it methodologically in the sense that maybe the methodology is problematic, the methodology of how one um, kind of goes about selecting the, the information you're going to have to understand what's happening in the UK. What do I mean by that? I think there is, <laughs> I think there's quite a lot of selection bias by, by the BBC and by you know, key institutions which are pretty focused on young people, uh, pretty focused on London, pretty focused on where power lies in British politics, which institutionally is London. And so I think lots of my friends, internationals, who are around the world, they they would pretty much have the working assumption that you you're out you're outlining your room, that it would seem all the data information they're getting, that that's right. And I think it's almost like so it's a problem of selection because the people who are selecting the sort of voices and messages, I think without wanting to sound all fake newsy and irrational, I think, you know, the BBC do have a problem here with editorial policies in line. And it's something that John Humphrey said and Robin Aitken said and Michael Burke has said and Jeremy Paxman has said. There's, there's four notable journalists there who have sort of left and said, gosh, at least we should, wish we could have a, a bit of a, you know, a bit of a broad, uh, opinion, bit of opinion diversity. So I think the problem is, is that um, there wasn't very much really going down deep. I mean, I did a piece of Sky News in Hull, uh, on, and um, I think there was genuine surprise that um, um, in, in places like Hull, which are solidly Labour, rock solidly Labour, three Labour parliamentary constituencies, three constituencies surrounded by a whole blue East Yorkshire um, morass of conservatism. They were surprised that these people are amongst the most Eurosceptic in the country. Partly what Mark says about fishing. I thought that was interesting talking about fishing and then red herring. Sovereignty was a red herring. Fishing wasn't a red herring, I presume, just a regular herring. I thought that was quite nice. Um, but but um, so I think part of it's sort of like selection bias and just a problem, you know, so it's, it's not one's fault. It's just if one is just reading the mainstream news, you think, wow. Also, young people tend to be more likely to go out and protest, don't they? We know that, you know, people in your 40s and are raising kids and the people in their sort of 60s and 70s are, you know, perhaps more retired and stuff. So I think that's just problematic. And I think there's a London, a, a metropolitan issue there. So I think the bottom line was um, your scepticism hardened. There was a little bit of bias remorse by some people. That's true. Three, four, five percent of people. I think that's right. But that's understandable. And in any any binary sort of referendum, any kind of Thing like that you get a little bit but people in the most eurosceptic areas their views hardened people in the most remain areas their views hardened and and the i think also you have to consider it wasn't purely a brexit election it was largely it, the issue of jeremy corbyn was also very notable 
-hmm. you know, and it was almost a referendum about whether you wanted Jeremy Corbyn as prime minister. And even if Boris isn't especially popular, um, I think a lot of people thought the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn as primus inter pares was unthinkable. And uh, Mark, uh, your assessment of the, of the general elections? I basically would echo everything Matt said. So firstly, I will point out that no matter what the media was saying, opinion polls suggested that the um, vote on Brexit, the, the opinion on Brexit remained almost, remained basically static. And in fact, I would go slightly further than Matt, because whereas Matt emphasised that there was some buyer's regret, I would also add that there were some people who voted against Brexit who then came to want Brexit, either because they just thought, oh, just get the whole thing over with. Um, you know, we've had enough. So I, I, I just think it was raw. If anyone got the impression that there was a wave of feeling against Brexit within the UK after the referendum, they were mistaken. And the opinion polls never suggested there was. Mm. Um, so I don't think it's that surprising. I also agree with Matt that the, in some ways, the elect, even if that wasn't so, which it was, but even if it wasn't, it's important to see that Brexit had was a, an issue in the election, but by no means the dominant one. Um, I think that the the I would go further than that, and I think that for as long as Corbyn had remained head of the Labour Party, there was no way Labour would have been elected. Um, Labour, uh, I, I think the perception in the country as a whole was that Labour had been taken over by the far left um, and that uh, it was unelectable. Um, I don't think that was necessarily the case, but I don't think the Labour Party did a good job of making clear why it wasn't the case. And I think the Labour Party now looks like a much more solid electoral prospect, irrespective of whether you preferred the Corbyn policies or the, or the Stanmer policies. How about the Liberal Democrats, Samar? Well, Britain's, Britain's a first past the post system, and it's really hard to come as a third party and break that up. Um, it's just really, really difficult. It, of course, happened when the Liberals moved over to Labour, but that happened over a long time. And it's hard in part because for two main reasons within a first-past-the-post system. One is that in most countries, people's party affiliations are very stable. Even people who call themselves independents, like when you see them on the telly after a presidential debate, they're rarely actually independent. They normally know where they lie. They just like to call themselves independent. So party affiliations are actually often pretty static. So it's also not that surprising that you find areas that voted against Brexit nonetheless voting conservative in a general election or who voted in, in favour of Brexit, nonetheless voting Labour in the election. Affiliations matter, and the Liberals went in with low party affiliation and came out with low party affiliation. But the second reason is it's difficult is because the Liberals never really found a, a, a line they could take that differentiated them and that appealed to a widespread base and I think that's it. I think they were always unlikely to do so I mean if we were looking outside the two dominant parties I actually think the interesting thing about the election is the rise of other parties including to some extent the Green Party and what that says about a fragmentation of British political attitudes interesting and uh, Terry you the floor Yeah, so I'd like to take a question from the audience from Diane Schumacher. She asked, how will Brexit affect the labor rights of British people working in the EU and Switzerland? Um, I don't think it, well, I don't think it will. I think there's one of the earliest commitments, and this is when May was PM, was that it would be the, a spirit of reciprocity. Now, of course, the devil's always in the detail but you have about a million UK citizens who, who live at least half the year, if not reside in the, in the EU. And that's an awful lot of people. And so, I mean, you could say, oh, you're just being optimistic. The devil's in the detail, but I think the spirit of reciprocity hasn't been, hasn't been um, renounced. I'll try and be quick with these because I know there's lots of questions in the chat. Thanks, Matt. Mark? Yep, I would largely agree. Um, 
The right, I mean, the, the one thing to say is the rights of British citizens to now take up jobs in the EU will change quite dramatically, I would imagine. Um, but if you're already working there, I don't think there will be much instant impact. There might be, but I think it's unlikely. Apart from anything else, the EU has a massive interest, probably a bigger interest than Britain, in maintaining the status quo. Because if you look at somewhere like the south of Spain or large parts of France, the amount of income they get from retired British people living there and spending their pensions there is huge. So actually, the, EU, the EU benefits more from British people living in the EU than it, than, than it costs. Interesting. Um, let me also have a look at, uh, looking at the questions from, from the audience. I noticed that many people are asking questions about the, the trade agreements. Uh, and as you, as you all know, uh, one of the reasons that, that, that people voted in favor of Brexit was this idea that, that with Brexit, the UK would have the freedom to establish its own trade agreements with Canada, with China, with the United States. Uh, so one question would be, where does this stand? Uh, uh, is there any progress? Um, also, uh, how much do you think the UK will and will have to accommodate in order to get those trade agreements uh, in place? And, 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 a, and a third question then related to trade agreements is, is the upcoming presidential elections in the United States. And, and the idea of a trade agreement between the UK and, and the US, um, what will, uh, how, how will this, the result of the elections influence that? Would such a trade agreement be much more difficult, for instance, if, if Biden were to be elected as president? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you see this, uh, Matt? I'll leave the Biden uh, question for, uh, for Mark. Um, in terms of, uh, he's obviously a much more astute follower of American politics than I am, I think. I think, well, we've done a deal, the UK's done a deal with Japan. Admittedly, that's not, it isn't, doesn't count for an awful lot of trade. But I think the principle of getting a deal done with a leading advanced industrialised nation is a good one. Um, I, th I think the fact that the UK has a, um, a balance of trade deficit with the EU of 66 billion quid at the end of 2018 matters. What do you mean? Well, what I mean by that is UK buys more goods from the EU than the EU buys from Britain, especially German goods. And so not only does I, do I think that has a bearing on the, on the EU's you know, keenness to actually you know, get a deal, but I think actually you know, that would actually reflect on Britain. It means that Britain is you know, a country that has, for, for want of a better word, an imbalance between its service economy, where it has a surplus with the EU and its trade. Um, Britain buys and imports an awful lot of goods, not just from the EU and Germany in particular, and Holland especially, but also from China and then from the US. So in terms of um, UK PLC, very open, very keen to do, do so. Liam Fox did a lot of preparatory work when he was International Trade uh, Secretary uh, a couple of years back. So I think, I think it's viable. In terms of the Biden-Trump thing, I'm not sure, and I'll leave that to Mark. Okay, very good. Thank you, Matt. Mark? Um, yeah, um, well, I guess the first and most obvious thing to say is that what the UK can and can't do with non-EU countries is at the moment severely limited because it all depends what comes out of any agreement it does or doesn't reach with the EU. Right. If the UK agrees to abide by all sorts of EU rules, it can't sign trade deals that don't reflect those rules. So there's a massive limit to how much it can sign other trade deals or how much content it can give those trade deals until we're post, until we're into 2021 or whatever it is now, yeah, 2021. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's the first thing to say. They're not, the deal with the EU, I really don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's really up for grabs. I think both sides have reasons to want to deal, which are economic, but both have economic and political reasons not to. The EU's main political reason not to um, and I think the EU really doesn't have many economic reasons not to want an agreement with the UK. I think the EU basically loses if there isn't a deal economically. But politically, the EU is in problems if it makes it too easy for states who leave to get good deals with the EU, because other states would be likely to start to want to leave, I suspect. Because mm -hmm. um, as I said at the beginning, the EU is not a great institution and lots of people don't like it. It's better than nothing, but it's not great. Um, 
So, and on the UK side, there are, there are sectors and quite powerful sectors, particularly in relation to the Conservative Party, which are probably better off without a deal. Agriculture springs to mind. UK agriculture will probably be better off falling out without much of a deal compared to any deal that is likely to come through. And the Conservative Party has always been closely tied to farmers. So there are certainly big, powerful sectors in the UK which are unlikely to support any deal that's likely to come up. The UK also has um, reasons for wanting not to sign a deal to do with deals it might get with other people. I don't know. I might be wrong about this, as I said at the beginning, but I think the coronavirus should be worrying people more than it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the UK GDP fell by 20% in the second quarter, which makes it the worst hit state in the world through the coronavirus recession, which is obviously ghastly. Um, and that's in a context where over 40% of UK exports currently go to the EU. Um, so just in terms of the economic mess that the UK currently faces, you'll think they would want to stabilize something, even if it was just a short-term deal covering something like a five-year period. And to make matters worse, there's issues for both sides, but particularly the EU, about medical supplies. Um, so medical supplies, like many things, you know, it's supply chains. We all saw problems even within the US over that. And Germany is by far and away the largest manufacturer of um, medical supplies within the EU. And Britain is historically very dependent upon those. So you can also imagine that that might become an issue. So I think the coronavirus should encourage them to, but I don't know if it will. Um, I don't know about the US thing. On the one hand, Trump, you could say, well, he sees Boris as a bit of a kind of, I don't know, fellow traveler, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, on the other hand, he's more kind of like, look at me getting great deals for America and I need to show how I win and not go. I don't, I don't think it makes much difference. The one thing I do want to comment on, though, is I saw one of the questions asked about whether, whether, signing the internal market bill would mean that other countries would be less likely to want to form trade agreements with the UK because the UK had broken an international treaty slash law. And I think that's very unlikely. I just don't think that signing the internal market bill has any impact there whatsoever. The UK's case for signing the Internal Market Bill and what's at stake are really small issues that arise solely because of the problems of a border between Northern Ireland, which would be in the EU, and the rest of the UK would not. So they're over issues like, for instance, I mean, this is how small and petty it is. It's not politically petty because it gets into issues of sovereignty and what you're going to do about Ireland. But as a trade issue, and therefore what it actually seems to be about, it's really petty. So it's things like that under the um, Northern Ireland Protocol, what you require, because the UK can, companies can obviously freely move goods into Northern Ireland, so what you could require is that there's some sort of signing of declarations of what's moving across and that this will be done officially right so that you can track what's moving from the UK into Northern Ireland so that you can make sure that UK companies aren't using Northern Ireland as a backdoor into the EU market and the Northern Ireland protocol made that a requirement that any goods UK companies would send to Northern Ireland would be subject to these declaration forms, export declaration forms, even though from a UK perspective, there is no export, it's just movement within the UK. And what the Internal Market Bill does is give UK ministers the right to say there's no need for such export declaration forms. And th that's the level at which the Inter Internal Market Bill breaks a treaty. So even though I don't think the Internal Market Bill is a good idea, I don't. I think it's a bad idea, but nonetheless, I think that it's not going to have any impact on the way in which other states view the UK as a reliable trade partner. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Let me go back to, to Terry. I think if we were having a similar discussion about a major economic agreement in the United States, uh, the president's name would come up 
more often than in this discussion. And Boris Johnson has been brought up very infrequently. And I would just would like to hear about your analysis and evaluation of how Boris Johnson is handling this, the handling both Brexit and uh, given its interaction with COVID and the economic downturn. And, you know, just, just get, I just like to hear your, your two cents about how Boris Johnson is faring and, and does his, uh, how does Brexit reflect on his leadership? Um, I think it's a tale of two halves, very contrasting halves. I think in a way, you know, even if you weren't warm to Johnson, uh, the Conservatives managed to enable, uh, well, encourage people to lend, lend the Conservative Party their votes, especially people in places like Bishop Auckland and Blythe and the Red Wall across um, much of the North Wing. They've lent their votes to the Conservatives partly because they did not, they wanted to stop Jeremy Corbyn, uh, but partly because they, they want to, to use that hackneyed phrase to get Brexit done. So in that sense, you've got to look at Johnson's, how he's handled um, Brexit in terms of, he's got a majority of 80 seats. He's, you know, he's stolen seats that, you know, have been Labour since the dawn of political time. So in one sense, in terms of Brexit, he's, he's still got a solid bit of capital but the other half is completely different in terms of COVID. I mean, I've got sympathy for the man as someone who myself who's had in the past very serious respiratory conditions. I don't really think he's probably fit in 100% anyway, to be honest. And when you add to that, that he's never been a politician um, who is good on the fine detail of things. I mean, he's like the opposite of Gordon Brown. Brown had a very good um, possession of policy detail but he didn't have much charisma and he wasn't able to, he wasn't good at po political narrative and messaging. Well, Boris is the opposite of that. He's good at campaigning. He's good at phraseology, but he's not a details man. He's not a man to really get down into the detail of policy. And as we saw yesterday, with the fact that he had to just, he made an error, which you might think, oh, everyone can make an error. But it was, a, you know, it could be fairly scripted, you know, the announcement he made and the confusion he showed about lockdown measures in the northeast of England. And he had to make a sort of like a public announcement saying, look, I got that confused. I mean, I think, I think it's a tell of two halves. You know, he, he's stronger on one and much weaker on the other, but I don't think he's 100% fit to be on this tell. Mark? Um, yeah, I don't really know, to be honest. I mean, I, I'm, not, I, I'm anything but an admirer of Boris Johnson. Um, I, don't, I don't think he's a, I don't think he's a particularly good politician. I don't even think he's particularly good at messaging, unlike what Matt said. Um, I think he got very lucky in becoming prime minister. I think absent Brexit and almost no one else wanting to be prime minister, that wasn't going to happen. Um, I also, though, don't know how much it's helpful to think about this in terms of Boris Johnson handling Brexit. I mean, Britain is not a presidential system. So you're talking about how the Conservative government handled it. And I, 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 I guess, yeah, I think I don't know is the answer. I mean, I, I sort of hear what Matt's saying, and I, I would phrase it slightly differently. I think the Conservative government has done a reasonably good job of dampening of, of a playing into uh, an anti-European feeling in Britain, which should not be understood as anti-European in a simplistic way, but it should be understood as a respect for the idea that Britain is different from continental Europe, that it has a common law, that it has freedoms that are entrenched within a common law, that it's not a status society with a Roman law tradition. And I think themes like that have played across well, and I think they have helped to um, create, uh, create slash play into a broad anti-European feeling. I think where, from my own taste, I have some sympathy. I would say I have some sympathy with that argument. I am naturally, I naturally like multiculturalism, pluralism, diversity. So, I, and I do quite like the anti-status nature of the common law system compared to top-down legal systems such as those which dominate most of the rest of Europe. So, I do have some sympathy for that argument, and I. But I, I'm out of sympathy with what I think in recent times 
particularly over the last month or so, has been a drift to seeing the moving out of the European Union as similar to um, asserting a, a traditional unionist policy. And obviously part of that is at stake in terms of um, just trying to, to say we're not going to have any sort of border or we might not have any sort of border between the UK and Northern Ireland. But there are other issues there. I mean, although I think the Scots would be crazy to leave, I went through that earlier, I can understand why they'll be annoyed, right? I mean, Brit uh, under the British Constitution, there's something called the Sewell Convention, which requires that anything of significant constitutional nature should be subject to at least a non-binding regulate uh, non-binding vote showing agreement from devolved parliaments. So, in principle, the Internal Market Bill should have been discussed and voted on in the devolved parliaments, and they should have all expressed agreement. Right, that's what the Sewell principle means before the bill went through, and that's not happened. Right, and. Johnson has made it quite clear that even though there's opposition in the devolved parliaments, the Northern Ireland parliaments voted against it, I think, um, that he's just going to railroad through the internal market bill anyway. So, it, and that clearly is a reassertion of central Westminster power, of English power, if you like, over the other nations. And I'm, I think that, I don't like that, and I think it's arguably a big mistake. But uh, who knows? It, it depends whether you mean a big mistake politically, a big mistake in terms of the way in which British society might evolve. But it's something that I personally really don't like. I'm, I'm quite happy in a way with the idea of reasserting aspects of a common law tradition. I'm also, although I would have liked us to stay in the EU, I do, as I said earlier, I think we're a more multicultural society, more diverse society and more open society than virtually anywhere within the European Union. And I think we're more likely to carry on being so as a result of leaving. But I don't like the assertion of a traditional conservative agenda at the centre of Westminster tied to unionism. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, let me follow up with, with a summary of questions uh, from the audience about Northern Ireland, also the relations between the UK and, and Ireland going forward. Um, so one question was, could the UK government use the Good Friday Agreement to claim that the Northern Ireland Protocol is impossible to implement? Another question was, what about the Irish border? Will there really be a hard border between Northern Ireland and, and Great Britain? So how do, you how do you see things evolving in Northern Ireland? How do you see the relationship between the UK and Ireland evolving uh, in the coming months and years, uh, Matt? Yeah, I think the first question makes a good point. I think in a way that's Northern Irish protocol does undermine the Belfast, sometimes called the Good Friday Agreement. I think that's right. It, the Belfast Agreement sets out that, you know, East-West and North-South relations, um, you know, can't be tampered with. And I think in a way, that's exactly what the Northern Irish Protocol does. So I that you know that's a fair point. So I think ultimately, one argument is um, Mark might not like this uh, notions of unionist traditionalism. But if you think back to the Act of Union 1800 uh, between Great Britain and Ireland, bringing the great in, creating the United Kingdom of uh, Great Britain and Ireland, um, that that whole the narrative. And the principle behind that is that um, there is a tradition of sovereignty and it's very hard to see how the EU can make a case that um, by Britain breaking um, the withdrawal agreement, it's somehow egregious, not only because the EU breaks its own legislations and commitments, as we've already talked about, Airbus, Eurozone, crisis, bailout, things like that. But surely the United Kingdom, as a, as a sovereign nation state that's outside of the EU, must be allowed, must be allowed to secure its internal integrity. Now, I mean, I think that's just almost a first principle. And you can see that, I think, in the Act of Union 1800. But I think you can see that 
you know, in, in other documents. And I think there's a case, isn't there? What's the case? There's a case, uh, EU law, is it? It's uh, 2008 uh, Caddy in 2008. And, um, you know, um, Daniel Hannan made this point actually in an article he made. He said that that's a good example that the, the Caddy versus EU Commission 2008 is an example where the European Court of Justice said that um, international law doesn't necessarily, doesn't and shouldn't trump EU law on issues of constitutionality. In other words, there has to be almost a first principle where the EU, uh, EU or EU rights and EU laws are allowed to, you know, look after themselves. And and I think international law is evolving anyway. So, uh, so for me, I think the question is, is on to something, to be honest. Matt, um, since we're running out of time, uh, I, I would like also to give Mark a chance to answer that question. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't. I, sorry. We only have a couple of minutes. So. I don't think that sovereignty needs to be unified, um, and I don't think it needs to be has, uh, tied closely to states. I think that's part of what the EU has shown us. So I don't think that it, that it needs logically to go in the direction it seems to be or to be passed in that way. And I'm not a fan of the idea that states are sovereigns in a unified way and that there shouldn't be more overlapping competing jurisdictions. So my views are indeed somewhat different from Matt's. Where I do agree with him is that I do think there is in principle a conflict between the Northern Irish Protocol and the Good Friday Agreement. I think there is. Um, and I think that the part of what's at stake here, well, the very simple way of putting it is that if, if the more you see sovereignty as fixed, either Northern Ireland is going to be treated as the part of the UK, and to have even a customs border between the rest of the UK and the Northern Ireland is not compatible with the UK's sovereignty over Northern Ireland, or Northern Ireland is not. I don't think you have to face that question quite that bluntly, but I think you do. Um, I think if you face it that bluntly, and I think the Conservatives are always going to be inclined to face it that bluntly because they are committed to UK sover the sovereignty of the UK, then you're going to insist that Northern Ireland remains part of the UK. I was therefore absolutely astonished, as I said earlier, that the Conservatives agreed to the Northern Irish Protocol in the first place. I thought that was astonishing, and I can thoroughly understand why they no longer want to stick by it. I think the chances of the Conservatives happily going on with any agreement that does not keep the UK sovereignty over Northern Ireland verges on zero. I think the only way in which you move back to a fudge of the issue that looks where it looks more like Northern Ireland is closely tied to the EU is if the Conservative government is replaced by a Labour government. So let's hope that happens before too long. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mark. Now, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, one o'clock has passed. So unfortunately, we will have to uh, conclude our conversation here. I wanted to thank all of you in the audience uh, for attending the event, for being so active uh, in the chat room. And I also wanted to thank uh, Terry, uh, my co-moderator, for doing such a great job. A uh, big thank you also uh, to my colleague Julia behind the scenes who organized everything. And of course, um, thank, uh, a big thank you to the two uh, speakers, uh, Matt Beach and Mark Revere, for a very informative and, and civilized um, conversation uh, on the topic of Brexit. Uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, for attending, and I hope to see many of you at a future event here at IAS. Thank you so much, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.